Hi everyone. Um, the topic of today's talk is based on the work I did during my PhD. These pictures in the background are that of the Crab Nebula from five different observatories. Starting in red is radio, then infrared, then optical, ultraviolet and X-ray. The last image is a composite representation from all five. In general, the multi-wavelength, multi-messenger um, study of a source allows us to grasp a global and complete understanding of the source in question. Gamma rays, unfortunately, do not provide visually appealing images. This blob on the right, um, not to the same scale, is the Crab Nebula, and it's how this looks in gamma ray energy, and it flares. So the point of studying sources in gamma rays is that we do learn a lot about processes ongoing in that environment. So before we come to gamma rays, we have to know uh, about cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are high energy particles that move through space at nearly the speed of light. They originate from astrophysical sources like the sun or from outside the solar system or even from distant galaxies. They were discovered by Victor Hess in 1912 in balloon experiments where he noted an increase in the density of ionized particles with increasing altitude. This ionizing radiation had to be emanating from beyond the Earth's atmosphere. This discovery earned Hess the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1936. Cosmic rays consist of 89% protons, 8% helium nuclei, 1% heavier atomic nuclei like um, carbon, oxygen, neon, magnesium and so on um, are showed in, in the plot, 1% electrons and a very, very small fraction of antimatter such as positrons or antiprotons. Now coming on to gamma rays, that they are produced via the interactions of these highly energetic charged cosmic ray particles with different environments they encounter. Due to the distinct types of charged particles we just saw and different ambient astrophysical media, matter, radiation or magnetic field, the nature of the interaction is not unique and lead to different gamma ray emission mechanisms. If electrons are responsible, the channel is leptonic. Otherwise, if protons are responsible, the channel is hadronic. So the first mechanism is Bremsstrahlung or breaking radiation. This is when a photon is emitted as a result of energy loss of electrons as they get decelerated while passing in the electric field uh, in the vicinity of atomic nuclei and ions. Second is inverse Compton. This is when a high energy electron scatters off a low energy photon such that the latter gains energy and the former loses energy. Then third we have synchrotron. Here electrons with relativistic velocities are moving in a magnetic field. They spiral around the magnetic field lines. And as a result of this circular motion, the electrons experience an acceleration and therefore emit photons. The last one is neutral pion decay. So when a proton collides with another proton or with a heavier nuclei, pions are produced. Without um, going into too much details about pions, there exist charged pions which decay into muons and neutrinos and neutral pions which decay by emitting a pair of photons. Now in all these cases, the photon emitted could have a range of energies, but we are interested only um, in this gamma, in this gamma ray energy. 
So astrophysical sources, as we have seen, inject cosmic ray particles in their surroundings, for example, protons. So since these are charged particles, when they encounter magnetic fields, they get deflected. Therefore, they may never reach us at Earth. However, as we have just seen, these injected protons can also interact with the interstellar medium or interstellar radiation fields to form secondary particles like photons with energy in the gamma ray or particles like neutrino. So these photons or neutrinos, they have no charge. They therefore travel in straight line paths to us and hence they point back to their origin, which means that it allows us to deduce things about the source or the source environment. Since I will be working with gamma rays, I um, will ignore the neutrinos from now on. So gamma rays, they are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. They come in a broad range of energies, typically above 100,000 electron volts. Electron volts is the unit for energy that we that we use. And um, there is no single observatory that can cover this entire range. The Earth's atmosphere absorbs gamma rays so that direct detection has to occur in space. For example, with the Fermi um, gamma ray uh, space telescope, uh, the LAT mission on board it, uh, Large Area Telescope. Indirect detection, however, can be made using ground-based observatories, and examples of such observatories are the High Energy Stereoscopic System, HES, or HOC, High Altitude Water Tranquil Observatory. Such instruments require the gamma rays to interact in the atmosphere first, and hence, they have a set range of energies where they operate. This energy regime is called very high energy. My work is in the context of Hawk, the High Altitude Water Triangle Gamma Ray Observatory. So I will introduce this observatory in more detail. Hawk consists of a main array and an outrigger array of water tanks. The observatory is in Puebla, Mexico, on the flanks of the Sierra Negra volcano. It works from the concepts of indirect observation of gamma rays, which produces secondary particles in atmospheric showers and the Cherenkov effect in water. Hawk operates in the energy range 300 giga electron volts to 100 tera electron volts. It is at an altitude of 4,100 meters above sea level, and the main array covers 22,000 square meters on ground. The main array consists of 300 steel tanks, each of which is a huge 7.3 meter in diameter and 5 meter in height, which is roughly as tall as a T-Rex dinosaur. Each tank contains about 188,000 liters of purified water and is, is in, instrumented with four upward facing photomultiplier tubes or PMTs. A PMT is a light sensing device sensitive enough to detect single photons and they have extremely fast response speed on the order of tens of nanoseconds. I will come back to uh, a PMT in a moment. Each of uh, the main array tanks have three peripheral 8-inch PMT labeled A, B, and D, as shown on the, on the schematic, and a centrally 10-inch uh, PMT uh, called a C. On the other hand, the outrigger array consists of 345 smaller plastic tanks of 1.55 meter diameter and 1.65 meter height. This array covers 
roughly four times the area of the main array on ground, and each tank is in instrumented with only one centrally placed 8-inch PMT, also facing upwards. So when a gamma ray photon of energy greater than 1.02 um, million electron volts enters the atmosphere, in the vicinity of an atmospheric nucleus, it produces an electron-positron pair. These release a photon of high enough energy through Bremsstrahlung, such that the process of pair production in Bremsstrahlung is repeated over and over, forming a cascade of particles, which then reach the water tanks at the Hawk site. In red, on the left is a realistic simulation of such a shower. In the water, the atoms and molecules move accordingly to compensate for the presence of these charged particles, hence inducing a net polarization. Once the particles have passed, the medium relaxes through a series of dipole transitions which are responsible for uh, emission of electromagnetic radiation. For sufficiently uh, energetic particles traveling faster than the velocity of light in the water, this radiation adds coherently in the shape of a cone. This emission is called Cherenkov radiation and the PMTs are calibrated to detect that light. Coming back to the PMT, on the left uh, side of the slide is a picture showing a 10 inch PMT on the left and uh, an 8 inch PMT with coaxial cables on the right. And uh, on the right side is a schematic of the PMT which describes its, its functioning. Essentially, a high voltage is applied to the PMT, giving it an electric field between um, a negatively charged cathode, intermediate dynodes, and a positive anode. When a Cherenkov photon is incident on the cathode, it knocks out uh, an electron through the photoelectric effect. The latter then proceeds towards the positive plate, knocking out other electrons in its way, such that an amplified signal can be read out, uh, sorry, can be read out in terms of charge or photoelectrons or just PE. The PMT signals are received by the data and acquisition system, and we basically save observables such as the light level or often called charge, um, as I just mentioned, in PE units. We also save the time of the trigger, the individual position of the PMTs, and so on. For example, on the left uh, figure, there is the position of all tanks. The color shows the trigger times recorded. So blue are particle uh, triggers that happen earlier, and then red is later. And the size of the colored circles indicate the light level of the tank. These information are used to reconstruct the event. Reconstruction is a rather technical term used by astroparticle physicists. It just means that we are going to estimate some shower parameters. For example, the shower core, which is the intersection of um, the shower axis and the ground. It's shown by the red star here. The gradient of the trigger time, this, this color gradient, is used to estimate the arrival direction. And um, we also estimate other um, quantities, such as the energy of the original gamma ray or the type of the particle. What do I mean by the type of particle? So as I showed in, in this previous slide, we do have some cosmic ray hadrons, so mostly protons, that make it to us. 
They don't necessarily point to their source, but they do reach us. These particles also form extensive air showers through hadronic interaction. And when their secondaries reach the tank, they also cause Charon curve radiation, which triggers our PMTs. Now, these signals are a background to the gamma ray signals that we require. And therefore, it is crucial to identify the type of particle causing the shower. This is called gamma hadron separation. There are a few ways to discriminate these two types of showers, but I came up with a method where we tag muons, which are mostly formed in, in hadronic showers. In this approach that I derived for um, gamma hadron separation, which is a noise reduction method, we, since we have four PMTs in the tank, I compared the response of the PMTs relative to each other. So I noted that um, there is an asymmetric response in the PMT light level, depending on where particles such as muons, which carry a large fraction of energy, where these particles land in the tank. For example, I have um, a histogram uh, of recorded events so we see that most entries land in this region, the region number two, and that corresponds to this scenario where most particles end up in between the PMTs. And then we can also have cases where the particle land close to a peripheral PMT or closer to the central PMT as in case number three and number one, respectively. So these cases, they produce this arm-like structure in this histogram. So this histogram is showing the contribution um, of charge from the PMTC compared to the total in the tank. So here in the case, uh, for case scenario one, we see that um, since the particle ended up close to the PMTC, PMTC is giving the highest contribution in the tank compared to um, scenario three, where you have a high light level in the tank, but little contribution from C because the particle ended up further away towards a peripheral PMT. So these asymmetries can be used to differentiate between a shower that has a muon or not. So these distributions are same as before, but for all particles in all the 300 tanks. Making use of both um, simulations and observations, I define um, templates of how gamma-like and how hadron-like showers would look. And then I define a new parameter, R, a new space, where I can uh, differentiate between these. So this space, R, here, is defined uh, through this equation, where L is the, the likelihoods, the templates I defined. So in this uh, space, we can take a look at how the distribution of actual gammas shown in, in red, which is simulation, and we can see how our measurements look. This is the green curve that we have to calibrate. We apply a set of selection cuts to the discriminator space, to this R space. So for example, we know that um, so the way it's defined, the more negative it is, the more gamma-like it is. And therefore, anything below this point should, in principle, be more gamma-like. Um, at this point, um, I will introduce the bins. So in Hawk, we classify uh, our events into bins. So this is done according to the fraction of the array that uh, has been triggered. 
For example, a small shower hits only parts of the array and a bigger shower can cover the whole of the array. And um, for I optimize this separation for different bins such that I have a set of selection cuts for all shower sizes. Now, events that look gamma-like under gamma-hadron selections are projected back on the sky by using arrival direction information from reconstruction, this time gradient I showed before. So Hawk sees the sky, the whole of the sky directly above it. So in this um, plot here, this point at the center is the zenith, this is the point directly above Hawk. And then everything else is uh, direction horizon to horizon from east to west, north to south. And then I can project this onto celestial coordinates. So this will correspond to this region. And as the Earth rotates, um, since Hawk functions almost 24-7 every, every, uh, all the time, we sweep approximately two steradian of the sky. So after processing of the data, the sky visible to us is shown in this map uh, here uh, on the left in celestial coordinates and in the right in galactic coordinates. We see, um, for example, the galactic plane and other sources like the Crab Nebula, Geminga and the Markarians. The white region in this um, galactic coordinate uh, map is, um, sorry, are uh, parts of the sky that are not visible to hawks. It's these regions. So they never came above the horizon. So they are outside our field of view. Now, I move on to modeling the background. What I call the background here is the fraction of events originating from hadronic showers, but which could not be identified as such in the gamma hadron separator space. That is, if I have selection cuts in my space for gamma-like events here, background would be those events from the hadronic showers, which were misclassified as being gamma-like. Now this plot here is a normalized one. So if I were to, to draw it as it is, it would be roughly as in this schematic here. And it, it's a significant proportion. And uh, the gamma sources are actually small excesses seen on top of this background. So it becomes really crucial for one to model their background correctly. Um, just like I define selection cuts to make um, gamma-like maps, I can define a new set of cuts and define hadron-like events and make hadron-like maps. I now make a legit assumption that the selection that I make can be scaled and used to represent the background. The scaling I refer to is the Y factor in this equation, and it is extracted from these two maps. It's extracted both, um, we look at the variation both in right ascension and declination from, from these two maps. Once I have background map defined for every point on the sky, I take the difference with the gamma map to find an excess map, just as we show here in the schematic, but in two dimensions. In this slide, I show how the excess map looks like. So we can see galactic plane, crab. So here I compare the excess maps from my model of the, of the background and on the right to a, a background model that is currently being used in Hawk, which is direct integration. 
The direct integration method assumes that the background produced from cosmic rays is isotropic. This means that they assume that we are receiving cosmic rays from every direction equally. This we know is not the case from several experiments already. The local cosmic ray anisotropy exists with an intensity of one parts per mil. The angular resolution of a telescope or observatory is the minimum separation on the sky from which you can tell that two points are in fact distinct. This value changes with energy. So the smaller it is, the finer details you can see. In Hawk, we call a point source one whose extension, whose angular extension, is not bigger than one degree of the sky. So this cosmic ray anisotropy is a gigantic feature, or as we say, it's a large scale structure. Hence, if you are looking for point sources, it doesn't matter if the background incorporates this anisotropy or not. However, if you are out searching for gigantic structures, then you will have to apply a correction, in which case the model background is better suited, because then you don't need this correction for the anisotropy. So the excess, uh, the excess maps are just visualizations of how good your background model is. Knowing that there is an excess or not is not enough, as it could, could just be a random fluctuation or an error in the approach. We need to know how significant the excess scene is. So the term significance is another technical term, and it is calculated using statistical descriptions and likelihoods, which I won't go into. The point, once you know you have a reliable background, you would um, apply a comparison of what you have, that is the excess, to the case of no signal, that is background only. This you do to quantify this excess, and it can be done at different angular scales. So you can go to your large scale search. For example, I worked at angular scales of one, two, four, eight, and 16 degrees. What this means is the following. So the gamma-like and hadron-like maps we saw before are a projection of Hawk reconstructed events onto a tessellated sphere. While working at, for instance, eight degrees, I'm simply gathering events in a circle of radius eight degrees all over the visible sky. You can imagine that instead of having a magnifying glass here, we have a merging glass, such that when you look through, you get the combined results of all neighboring cells within a diameter of your choosing. The significance map I produced are as shown with random noise at small scales and a large scale structure with up to 5.3 sigma significance at 16 degrees. At such large scales, it is difficult to identify a single source responsible for this excess scene as I described earlier, I correlated, I brought together a large number of pixels. So what I can do is I list some candidates in this region. So on this slide, I show a zoom of the region in question, and I list the sources that could be responsible as first pulsars. So we have the pulsar J uh, 1740, and J1846 in that region. The line of sight to the pulsar J1740 goes through um, the Gould Belt and the molecular cloud Aquila Rift and the North Polar Spur. 
Hence, it's a region with a lot of things going on. So I, I named the North Polar Spur, the Gold Belt and the Aquila Rift as potential sources as well. Here I show um, the North Polar Spur, which is part of uh, a hot interstellar bubble created by winds of young um, and uh, hot stars and also supernova remnants. It is a characteristic feature seen in X-ray and it also connects to the loop one feature, which is also seen um, in, in both X-ray and, and radio. Here I talk about the gold belt and uh, the Aquila Rift. So the gold belt is a local expanding disk of gas and young stars, which uh, major local molecular clouds appear to follow. The image on the on the right shows the Rho Ophiuchi uh, cloud complex, which is a star forming region in the gold belt. On the left, the image shows part of the Milky Way, uh, with the galactic plane being obscured by dark clouds. The most prominent uh, dark lane here is the Great Rift or the Dark Rift. The Serpent's Aquila Rift is part of this great rift and uh, it is a region of the sky in the constellation Aquila, Serpent's Cauda and Eastern Ophiuchus. In this slide I show a schematic of pulsars. So pulsars are rapidly rotating neutron stars with a strong dipole magnetic field they were first discovered by Jocelyn Bell in 1967. Such highly magnetized objects, they induce strong magnetic potential that are capable of accelerating cosmic ray um, particles to ultra high energy. Now these ultra high energetic cosmic ray particles then interact uh, as we've seen before, to produce the very high energy gamma ray emission. The interaction of um, these particles with the surrounding leads to the formation of pulsar wind nebula, as we have seen in the very first, very first slide for the Crab Nebula. So this is the re reason why um, it's so blurred in gamma ray uh, when you look at it in gamma ray compared to other wavelengths. So from my list of candidate sources, um, J1740, it is a relatively young pulsar that is off the galactic plane. Um, there was a study uh, on its associated pulsar wind nebulae that revealed a tail to the pulsar. This suggests that it's moving towards the galactic plane. However, as seen here, tails are not a common feature of pulsars. This was an occurrence uh, of an extreme case of outflow from the pulsar while it's moving supersonically. The energetics of the pulsar, so how fast uh, it's rotating and if it's slowing down, uh, so all of this and its proximity to the system shows that it could be responsible for the new emission scene. However, um, radio observations are lacking for this pulsar. The same uh, is true for 18, J1846. The energetics are comparable to Gaminga, which is a highly coveted source in gamma ray astronomy. However, it is six times further away. And again, we have a lack of radio counterpart. All these candidate sources make the source of this novel region quite confusing, but still very exciting. So that was a blind search I did for, um, for a hawk. I also did a source specific search by applying uh, all the tools that I developed. So 
for noise redu for noise reduction, the gamma hadron separation, the modeling of the background, and the signal processing uh, tools. I use those to search for signals from the Fermi bubbles. Uh, I will now briefly introduce the Fermi bubbles by enumerating its observed, derived, and unknown features. So observed, they are gamma ray structures first seen with a Fermi LUT at an energy range of one to 10 uh, giga electron volts. They are gigantic structures extending to approximately 55 degrees above and below the galactic plane. Uh, and they are roughly 40 degrees wide. Note here that 55 degrees on the sky corresponds to eight kiloparsecs. That is approximately 1,650,000 times the distance between Earth and Sun. So that's really huge. The bubbles have relatively sharp edges that are also seen in X-rays. And they have what has been called uh, an X-ray chimney in the inner um, 100 parsecs. So although they look quite symmetric about the galactic plane, they have, in fact, um, an asymmetric, a slight uh, asymmetric uh, feature. The, the southern bubble is slightly bigger by uh, five degrees, and there is a slight bent westward, so towards the right here. They are centered within the inner 200 parsecs of the galaxy. And although initially the Fermilat uh, collaboration concluded a relatively flat brightness spectrum and luminosity across this entire structure, recently they amended this statement uh, with uh, a more um, conclusive study that there is harder and brighter emission that is seen from the base. Uh, I will now talk about the derived features of the Fermi bubbles. So the bubbles are a result of non-thermal emission because we see high energy photons from them. Also, here I show multi, multi wavelength, multi messenger studies that has been done for the Fermi bubbles. And these have revealed some associated structures, some coinciding regions, such as the microwave haze, the North Polar Spur, and uh, the Loop One. So these being um, so close together, they, it's often suggested that they could have a common or a related origin. Uh, since some features are seen in X-ray, it means that the bubbles are hot and they are under dense regions. The asymmetry I mentioned implies that there is an enhanced density uh, towards the east because they bend towards the west. Um, what is unknown about uh, the Fermi bubbles is uh, their age, the exact source generating this emission and the dominant gamma ray emission mechanism. So with the signal search in Hawk, which is work still in progress, we want to know how the bubbles look at higher energies and therefore contribute to the global understanding of how um, energy is efficiently distributed over, over such large scales. This brings me to my last slides. So conclusion and things that we still have to do. What we have seen is that large scale structures have faint signals mm -hmm. extended over gigantic regions of the sky, which is then in spatial overlap with other sources. To effectively study these gigantic sources, we need to clean our measurements by first reducing the noise, which is done through gamma hadron separation, um, secondly, we model the background to extract a signal from, from these sources. And last, we 
process that signal to see how strongly it appears on top of the background. So by using these tools, I unraveled a new gigantic source of high energy gamma ray emission. However, there are a few known sources in that region, so I'm yet to point out what is the actual cause of this emission. On another note, um, I choose to work on the Fermi bubbles because they're so big and um, there is so much we don't know about them. However, only the northern, or here the upper uh, bubble, lies in the field of view of Hawke. So we only have partial coverage for the southern or lower bubble. Moreover, as Hawke is based in Mexico, that is the northern uh, Earth hemisphere, the lower part of the northern bubbles, this part, is it, it comes above the horizon and it stays above ground for only a few hours per day, which means we collect very little data. Hence, we have low sensitivity to that part of the sky. Some of us at um, Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics are involved in an effort to build a Hawk-like detector called um, SWGO, which stands for a Southern Wide Field Gamma Ray Observatory in the Southern Hemisphere, so that we can observe the parts that we are missing out with Hawk. And um, yeah, this brings me uh, to the end of the talk. Uh, thank you for your attention.